Amen. Amen. So if we, what we're going to do is we're going to slightly continue on from last week. And today we're looking at the enemies of the glory. I want you to know, and we've talked about this time and time again, that there is a spiritual war going on. And the thing is, is I, I remember, was it last, last week or the week before, I had somebody online saying, why are Christians always talking about battle? Will anybody ever experienced a, a spiritual battle? Anybody been ever been through something where you've had to stand firm and equip yourself with the Ephesians 6 armor of God? Because we're meant to. Just because you're saved doesn't mean that everything stops coming against you. In fact, what it does is it puts a target on you. You're now saved. You're born again. So the devil is now trying to dampen your light, to extinguish your light to the point that you're not shining and projecting hit the image of God to the world. I want to look at this in the strategy of the enemy because we can see there's a strategy manifesting on the earth today. And we can see that there's a strategy coming against the people of God today. And as that strategy is manifesting and is coming against, it is, it is behoof of each and every one of us to be aware of it, to be equipped to deal with it, and to be strong enough and strengthened in the spirit to stand against any fiery dart of the enemy. And I want to talk about this because, listen, the glory of God was seen. In the times of Moses, it was represented as the Shekinah glory. When Moses came down off Mount Sinai, his whole face shone from spending time in the presence of God. You know, it says in Ezekiel or Exodus 33 um, that Moses saw God panem el panem, face to face. Now, we often quote the fact that he saw the back end of God walk by him. But it says that he spoke to him like a friend and he communed with him like a friend. And I say the more time you spend in the war room of God, the more time you spend in his presence, you cannot come out the same way you went in. You come out shining the glory of God. You come out emanating. And it's nothing to do with you. In Ezekiel 28 verse 16, it talks about the, the abundance of trading of the enemy. But it also calls him one thing. It says he was the covering cherub. Now, back in the, the times of the Old Testament, they had the ark, and the ark represented the presence of God. And inside the ark was the presence of God. But it, over the top of the ark, they had two covering cherubs, two covering angels. It says that Lucifer's jaw was to reflect. He would have stood, and he would, when he, the glory of God shone, he was covered in these precious stones, and that glory would have reflected back onto God. And something was found in him. And what was found in him, the fact that he started to see that glory as himself. He started to hold it. Well, look how amazing I am. Look how I'm shining. But you're not shining because of you. You're shining because of who shines on you. When it says in Isaiah 60, arise and shine for your light has come. You know, you're not the light. You know, modern day Christianity says it's all about you, 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 you. But the Bible doesn't. Every page of the Bible testifies of him. It's about him. And your job and your, your change through the beholding of him in scripture is to reflect him and to be a conduit of the light. There's no, there's no you know, I will get saved. And when I get saved, you know, God's going to exalt me into this position. Listen, anybody who seeks to be exalted in the presence of God has got it backward and they don't spend time in the presence of God. Because I tell you, when you come away out of your private secret room praying to God, you cannot help but feel smaller and smaller. Not because he is doing that, but because you start to recognize the majesty of him. When you see how awesome he is, when you start to realize that there's not a problem that you go through in life, that if you don't seek yet first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness, he will fix, he will get deal with the problem. But don't come to him with the provocation of self. Don't think that you are now shining your own light. You're only merely a reflection of the light. The problem is that what happened, and you know, there's a war going on, there's a spiritual war, but the spiritual war has a, a main motive, and the main motive is the narrative. And I'm going to explain that. You know, back in, in World War II, you had people like Joseph Goebbels who, who controlled them with their propaganda masters, and they controlled the narrative of things. And listen, you yourself will have a constant narrative going on in your head. And I'm telling you right now, and I'm warning you, because I don't want you going out the same way you came in, 
although you do go through that door. <laughs> I want you going out changed and equipped. The narrative is that it's all about him. When you start to see that it's all about you, start to think that it's all about you, you're going to twist that narrative and you're going to build up a story in your head. And this is where we get idolatry and adultery before God. Because the idolatry builds up God in your own image, which is not the case. In Genesis 4, verse 26, there is the story of Enosh, the, the, the line of Enosh. So Seth, the son of Adam, had another son, Enosh. And Enosh, during the time of Enosh, we see the beginning of idolatry in the world. There's no point in me doing notes at all. I thought we'd go to the creek. Yeah. It's it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the original. So when we look at the original wording of this, we read it in our Bible that in the beginning, in the time of Enosh, they started to call on the name of God. But that's not what it says. It says that then men began to call upon false gods with the name of the Lord. You see, what the devil tries to do is to get us to put something else in place of where God should be and to call it God. Now, in the Old Testament, you could have looked at Baal, Moloch, you could have looked, you looked at Ashra, you could have called them, and they would have called them gods. But sometimes that hasn't changed in our lives. Sometimes what we do is we take even the littlest things and we ordain that as God in our life. Oh, God is the car that I drive. God is my family. God is my job. It is the thing that is sitting first and foremost in your life. God is the reputation that I have. You know, one of the things that I remember, Kelly had a prophetic word. And she said in this prophetic word, you know, I, I, for years I held on to my reputation. I had a reputation in the martial arts. And it meant a lot to me. And she said, God's told me he's going to wreck your reputation. He's going to break you so you don't depend on that. Listen, if you exalt something ahead of God in your life, that becomes God. And, and that's, that goes back to Isaiah 14. The purpose and the, the strategy of the enemy was to exalt himself to the most northern part ahead of Yahweh. So that everybody would look upon him and worship. And I said last week, if you look at the, the vision that Jacob has in Je, uh, Genesis 28, when he looks and he sees the ladder going up and down to heaven and, and there's angels descending and there's angel, angels ascending. God wasn't on the ladder. God isn't even in that realm. He was above the ladder. And this is the thing. The devil knows that he can never exalt himself above God. But what he wants to do in each and every one of our minds is to get us to usurp, to bring God down a peg or two. Put something else up. Listen, you want to see where your treasure is. That's where your heart is. You want to see what is God in your life. You have to question, what are you taking a knee to? Do you take a knee to the presence of God? Are you taking a knee to your own reputation? Are you taking a knee to wealth? Are you taking a knee to influence? Are you taking a knee to, your, to, to whatever, to your personality and how people like you? What are you exalting ahead of them? Because whatever you exalt ahead of them, the enemy knows that will be used and he's got that already marked out the strategy to bring about a fall with you. When we look at this, the, the devil has the strategy and the strategy to, is to bring in a new narrative and the narrative is that you put something else in place of God. Deuteronomy 32 verse 17 says, they sacrificed to demons that were not gods. Do you understand that even when you look at uh, like different statues and things that people put in their houses, they are represented according to the scripture as demons. They are not just an ordinary statues. Okay, we are worshiping a statue or your friend a statue. It's not that. It's the demonic element behind it that you start to put God in a box and you start to say, this is God. And Psalm 106, verse 34 says, they mingled, talking about Israel, with the nations and adopted their customs. They worshiped their idols, which were which became a snare to them. The devil is trying to trap you. And what he does to try and trap you is to get you to mingle in the sense that you have compromised and marry yourself to the world. You marry yourself to, to the, the, the spirit of the world and you're no longer differentiated from it and therefore, you can, the devil can exalt something else in your life ahead of God, and that's what becomes your, force, your, your, your focus of worship. This is all he does. He knows he can't physically take the place of God, but he can try and take God out of the place in your mind. That's why the first commandment 
is to love thy Lord, the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul. We're meant to do that. Not because God is egotistical, but God is everything. He is Yahweh. He is the I am. And when we have him in the position, it just changes us. You know, I, I'll be honest. I went, we lived by the beach, and I went to, I just went out. Everybody was in bed. Went out in the middle of the night, storm. And it's just to walk along the beach and pray. Because something hit my heart. This is personal. This is like my, this is Gary's therapy time, by the way. Um, and it was because, you know, I, I, a few videos that we had shared last year were starting to get shared all around the place. And people were going, oh, that was amazing, or that was amazing. And I thought, God, I don't want, I don't want any adulation. I don't want anything where it could be seen as, oh, look at that preacher. Or listen to him. I don't want that. Because all I want to do is reflect him. I don't want it to be for one second put upon, oh, didn't he speak well today? Or didn't he speak badly today? It shouldn't be about me. It should be about him. All I want to do is reflect him. That's, that's the heart that each and every one of us should have. That we want to go out and in every situation that you have, you reflect him. You know, you have an argument with your spouse. How about you don't respond and react as the world would respond and react. You reflect Jesus back. You show that love. You show that grace right back to them. This is, ex this is extremely key, right? Because, listen, the devil is trying to bring in a new narrative. And the way he brings in the new narrative is at first he silences the old narrative, the truth. We saw this before, and I'm trying to speak through this quite quickly because I'm only in my instruction, right? Um, we saw this before in Job 1 that he attacks the Sabians, and the Sabians were seen as slavers. And the slavers come in and they take the donkeys and the oxen. And the oxen, according to typology, represents the preachers of the truth of the Word of God. And the donkeys represent the authority and the power of the Word of God. So there's two strategies that the enemy has to change the narrative in your personal mind, in your personal walk. And as we're seeing out there in the world, across the globe, a new narrative is being ushered in. The first one, he silences the old narrative, aka the truth. And he binds, number two, he binds those who walk in truth and the power of the truth. Now if we look at these, these two should represent spurts in the Bible. They were actual people, but we identify the names behind the spirits to give us an example and to get of, of who and what these spirits are. The first one is Jezebel. Anybody ever heard of the Jezebel spirit? And the second one is Delilah. Now Jezebel, if you want to know who she was, she was the princess, uh, she was the class, uh, she was the queen, and she was Ahab's queen, but her name means princess of Baal. She was the daughter of Eth Baal. That means to with Baal. Now Baal, just let me give you a quick history lesson. If we go through this, Baal was represented in bull form as a god. He was a false god. And he was similar, if not equated to Moloch. Now Moloch was um, child sacrifice, child worship. They used to push, the, roll the babies in to the bull and the, they would burn to death. And if, as they burned to death, they believed they got a blessing back. So Israel have represented themselves not by putting their worship upon Yahweh, but they put the worship upon Baal. If we go back in history, if we go back to the um, Exodus and at Mount Sinai, they worshipped the golden calf, which was also known as the golden bull, which was Apis in Egyptian mythology. Right? It was the same false demonic god. It was a representation of the devil. If we go back further, we go back to Genesis 11 and we see the Tower of Babel and we see Nimrod who represents the first Antichrist on the earth. He came and he worshipped a guy called Marduk. And Marduk was represented by, guess what? A bull. It is the same system and it's the same demonic devil worship. The only difference that we see is the change in names. And the change in names happened in Genesis 11 when languages was, was, was confused. And all separated. And what we had, it was still demonic devil worship. So you have Jezebel, a princess of Baal, a daughter of Ephbaal, right? She stood obstinately in sin against God and the man of God, Elijah. She caused the nation of Israel to rebel against God. 
In Revelation 20, 20, she seduced believers through eating defiled offerings and adultery. Her whole agenda was to silence the voice of God. And she needed an Ahab to be compliant and complacent in the process. See, Ahab was her king, and Ahab was someone who wouldn't, do, wouldn't challenge her. In fact, gave her everything that she, she wanted. And we see that in the world right now. When the church is quiet and compliant and complacent in the, to the spirit of the world, so the spirit of the world says we can do X, Y, and Z, and that's not a sin. X, Y, and Z is not a sin. It should just be, the, the Bible should just be updated. The church should just be updated. The compliant, complacent, progressive church says, yep, yeah, that's fine. But the true church of God says, no, I stand and I exalt God and God alone. I will not fall to a new narrative. In fact, we're seeing right now that we've talked about this for a while. The WEF, the World Economic Forum, which is a, a global think tank on steroids. And they are, they were the ones who coined the phrase, the Great Reset. Klaus Schwab, the founder of the WEF, coined the phrase, the Great Reset. He coined the phrase, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And all through, from 2020 all the way through to now, you have seen a progressive move towards that. If anybody's went on their website, and listen, you don't think that they're standalone, the WEF are supported by the biggest world leaders. In fact, Klaus Schwab in 1992 formed a school of world leaders. And if you look at a who's who of world leaders in global politics today, they were attendees of that school. In other words, they had bought into the narrative that was given at that time. That school progressed, the, like uh, Klaus Schwab says, right, this is what we're going to do. This is the narrative that we're going to give. And they all start moving towards the 2030 agenda where it says that you will own nothing and be happy. In other words, you will be under the slavery of the system of an antichrist. You will be brought in under control and you will be subjugated to lies and a new narrative that does not go with scripture. Don't believe me? What is the agenda this year? 2022, the meeting of the WEF, the great narrative. They want to change the narrative so that everybody's singing off the same hymn sheet. This is reminiscent of Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel. Everybody sing off the same hymn sheet and step away from the truth that is the gospel. And it's the same in each and every one of your lives. Whenever you are, are going through something and you go, well, look, you know, Genesis 50 verse 20 says that whatever I is meant for my evil, God is going to use for good. So I'm going to trust God. I'm going to be joyful in the process. I'm going to be a James 1, 3 Christian that praises God and is joyful in the process of the tribulation and the trial that I experience. Or do you buy in like the world says? Do you start having the, the, the poor me side? The, do you start going into depression? Do you start letting the spirit of depression gather and have substance in your life? I'm talking from someone who experienced major depression. I'm talking as someone who tried to take his own life on more than one occasion. I'm saying this from the point of view that, look, you can't let that take root. Because when you realize that you're in a spiritual battle, you can start to fight the fight that is at hand. The new narrative, the great narrative. I think I actually wrote something there. Hold on. <laughs> Yeah, Klaus Schwab, the WEF, the new narrative, 2022. In order to imagine the future, you have to design the future. And then you have to execute it. We are here to develop the great narrative, a story for the future. You want a world singing off the same hymn sheet, and guess what? The gospel isn't in it. And can I say, what we see on the earth is simply a manifestation of what is neglected in the spiritual. If there's a spiritual warfare happening, when we see things and evil manifest greatly upon the earth, it is because the church has been quiet, silent, and redundant when it comes to that spiritual battle. Honestly, if you, listen, let me talk about Jezebel for a second. This Jezebel, she went about and she tried, she struck fear into the hearts of, of the prophets of God. She executed the prophets of God. She even struck fear into the prophet of prophets, Elijah, so much so that he went and hid in a cave. Can I just say, did anybody experience fear in 2020 where the churches were shut down and every church around the globe were hiding in a cave? <laughs> this is what we're seeing. And it hasn't stopped. 
It hasn't, it hasn't dissipated. It's still going on. The church is now afraid to step out. So whenever you go out in the street, I know preachers now who used to speak in the street who refuse to speak in the street because they're afraid of the, the, the recompense, what will come against them. People, you guys, I guarantee there are people who are now afraid to go in and share the gospel and work for fear of being shut down. Because the spirit of Jezebel is there to silence the voice of God. And it's to silence the voice of God in your life. You hear from God that God says that you're more than a conqueror, an overcomer, a king, queen, and high priest in Jesus' name. Yet you get up every day, you feel depressed and anxiety strikes into you. And you, you end up living your whole day stuck in that anxious state, in that depressive state, not listening to the voice of God because you've let the voice of God be silenced through the spirit of Jezebel that only the voice of fear and the, the fear propagating spirit stands up and that's what you're hearing. Anybody ever heard the words, you're not good enough? I heard one psychologist say that we, human beings, speak to ourselves every day. And, well, that's not, that's not me, right? But the average is 45,000 words said to yourself every day. And here's the thing. Studies say that 90% of those words that you speak are the same words that you spoke the day before. What you're doing is building up a narrative. You're building up a narrative. You're building up a story in your head. Listen, the Bible is what we stand on. It is the only story that we need to stand on. It is history at its core. It is righteousness. It is life. It is joy. It is the living word of God. And when you read it, it doesn't just be, it isn't just a case of you reading the book. It starts to read you. Don't fall to the new narrative that a Jezebel spur tries to sow. The other spur, can you throw that back up for me, Chris? The other spur that we talk about, these two spurs, Jezebel and Delilah. We all know who Delilah was. We can sing it. <laughs> no, we're going to, right? <laughs> Delilah spoke with a serpent's tongue in the ear of Samson. Samson, who was a Nazarite. When we hear that song, The Blessing, you know The Blessing? Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you. That's from number six. And that is a blessing specifically for the Nazarite. Because what is about Nazarite is the Nazarite is meant to separate themselves from society. They're meant to separate themselves from the spirit of the age. They are meant to look different, be different. So is the church. We're not to fall to the, in this war to the new narrative. We're supposed to be rehearsing the word of God so that we obey the word of God, walk in the word of God, and stand out from the world. She spoke with a serpent's tongue and used seduction to cheat Samson, who was a representation of the righteous, out of his ability to walk in the power and the glory of God. Listen, this is what the devil's afraid of. The devil isn't afraid of is that you get saved and God blesses you financially. That's a load of nonsense. That's prosperity nonsense. The devil is afraid that when a believer gets saved, that their light starts to burn, starts to shine, so much so that it can't be extinguished. Every attack that comes against your life, you just throw off and go, yeah, is that it? Every time the devil comes at you and tries to bring destruction and fear, and remember I said last week he works through three avenues. He tries to deceive, he tries to distract, and he tries to destroy you. And as he does so, you need to be realizing that, look, in that process, you have a choice. Do you represent it? Do you let the power of the glory of God be seen in you? Or do you fall to the narrative that he's trying to deceive into your ear? That you whisper in tongue that says, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not, you're not handsome enough. Never heard that. You're not, you're not able enough, right? You need to be able to silence the voice of the new narrative and listen to the voice and the word of truth. So he uses Delilah and he uses Jezebel to bring in this new narrative. We're seeing it across the world. We're seeing it right now. We're living in a Romans 1 time where people will be given into debased mindset. But why? Because I think it's Romans 1 verse 28 says that they did not hold God in their mind. If we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, we're to hold him in our mind. So that whenever the enemy attacks you, whenever lack comes against you, Whenever the spirit of turmoil and anxiety and frustration and, and anger comes against you, you don't fall to it. You defeat that with the word of God. 
This is key. It's quite rudimental teaching at the minute, but I'm just trying to bring it down to you. Let me experience, right? Let me explain this, right? We're in 2022. I believe there's through scripture two sets, two sets, and two sets of spirit or people that identify as this spirit. The first, we've just seen Jezebel and Delilah. I don't believe that's the actual name of these spirits. I believe Jezebel and Delilah held the characteristics of these spirits, walked in these spirits, acted in these spirits. Delilah tried to vanquish the power, the, the most powerful man at that time, Samson. They tried to vanquish him, destroy him. Why? Because he walked, in, walked with God. Jezebel done the same. She tried to silence the voice of the prophet. And what I put up here, you see it, this is the attack for 222 attack. We're living in the 222 time, 2022. Remember, this is a time, there's two, wisdom is mentioned 222 times in scripture. It's time to be wise. So it's a time to discern. Let me show you this. Jezebel and Delilah, the first set of two. Jans and Jambres, the second set of two. Hophni and Phineas, the third set of two. Let me explain who the second group are. Jans and Jambres. Right? And I know I'm doing the pronunciation like that. You don't really pronounce the J, but I'm doing it just so it's easier. So you understand and don't think I'm making stuff up. Jans and Jambres, right? They were mentioned in Timothy. They were also mentioned at the time. So whenever you go back to the book of Exodus, and whenever you see Moses come in and demonstrate the power of the glory of God in front of Pharaoh, who represents the sperm behind the age of the time, the sperm of the world. Egypt in typology represents the world. Pharaoh was the ruler of the, big, the world, the known world at the time. Whenever you see that, Jans and Jambres come in, and they are his magicians. So whenever Moses comes in and does a miracle, Shows, throws the stick down and it changes into serpents. Jans and Jambres tried to deceive by, cop uh, by copying, by imitating the miracle. To detract and distract you from the glory of God. They sought to distract the, from the glory of God, to silence the voice of God through Moses in Pharaoh's house. Jans means to seduce and cheat. That's what his name means, to seduce and cheat. Jambres means to rebel. They constantly sought to detract from the glory of God. Listen, the glory of God, the doxa, shekinah glory of God, needs to be seen in each and every one of your steps. I don't mean just your life. I mean your steps. Whenever you walk one way, walk another way, whenever you go into work, people want to look at you and say, there's something different about you. And it is not you. It is who you are. You're dying for yourself, but God is being seen in you. The, the presence of the Holy Spirit is emanating. The light is shining. You're reflecting, not projecting. And whenever you see this, if you can if you can move that back to the previous one for me. Jans and Jambres. No, no, the, the, the previous one we were looking at. You see, Jezebel, Delilah, Jans and Jambres, Hophni and Phineas, right? Jans and Jambres, one of the things that you, you noticed, right? They, they tried to deceive, they tried to seduce, they tried to uh, cheat. That Jezebel tried to seduce and cheat. Jezebel, whose name also means a rebel. Delilah, whose name can mean seduce and cheat. You see this spirit emanating through them. And then we go to the next ones. Hockney and Phineas. Now these guys, these guys represent the church, right? These guys represent the false church. In 1 Samuel 4, and actually I think it's 1 Samuel, yeah, it's 1 Samuel 4. These guys were priests. They were sons of Eli. And they were up to no good. What was happening is when women would come up with their, their offering, they were sleeping with the women. And then they were taking the offering that was meant for God and taking the choice parts for themselves. It is similar to Revelation 2.20, what we see Jezebel propagate, adultery, living in adultery, and at the same time, defiling the sacrifice. Hophni and Phineas were doing the same. They were living this way. They were, they were, uh, uh, and at the same point, let me just say this, they were, allowed to get away with it simply because Eli was complacent and compliant in the process. It's a picture of the church. The church being complacent. We're not going to call people out on sin because, do you know what? I got a tattoo that says only God can judge. I don't have that tattoo, by the way. I don't like angels. Anyway, Hopney 
Follow the example of Jezebel. Help me for this. They sacrificed. Uh, in, uh, their sacrifice was defiled and they committed adultery. Hopney, face, or his name means face of brass. Now, brass in the Bible represents an obstinate obstinacy of sin. Not just sinning, but nobody's going to tell me not to sin. Nobody's going to tell me that I can't sin. Who are you to judge me? Do you understand at some point, whenever the millennial kingdom happens, if you're a born-again, spirit-filled believer who is part of the faithful church and remain that way, you will come back and you're going to be positioned in a job that requires you to judge. That's what the scripture tells us. We will come back and we will judge. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron, talking about Jesus Christ, and we will be set up as judges with him. Judging, in this sense, when you see someone entrenched in sin, you don't then turn a blind eye to it because you think, well, you know what, it's not my face. Now, do you come out and you condemn them? No. You offer them the, the, the help and hand of Jesus. You show them their correction and the hand and the direction and where they should be going. Hockney's main name, oh, excuse me, I can't speak. Hockney's name means a face of brass. And brass in the Bible represents the obstinate na nature of sin. Just as we see with Jezebel, who stood in that obstinate nature of sin, who tried to get Baal as the chief god of Israel. Phineas' name means a serpent's mouth, just like Delilah who whispered into Samson. And the picture of deception and corruption as we see with the whispers of Delilah, the result of their behavior was something that actually strike fear into every Christian right now. It was the Ichabod moment. The Ichabod moment. What happened is the ark, the glory of God, was taken from Israel. Hotney, Phineas, and Eli were killed. Hopney and Phineas were killed in the battle. Eli then fell back and broke his neck. And the, um, one of their wives then ends up having a child. She's in the middle of labor and she has this child and she names him Ichabod. Ichabod means his glory is gone. His glory is departed. You're seeing the glory of God. Not necessarily in the captive building of the church, but out there on the streets. Because God is saying, you've tried to contain me. You have been up to mischief. You have been defiling yourself. You have been cheating with the spirit of the world. You've claimed that you're married to me. But what has happened, even though you're my bride, the bride of Christ, you went out and committed adultery with the world. And then you've tried to create a new image of me. You belong to a new narrative. You thought, it's okay if I sit here as I am and do what I do, as long as I just get up and I do what everybody else expects whenever they see me. It is the heightened point of hypocrisy that you have are one way behind closed doors and one way in front of people. God doesn't just wait until you are out there on a Sunday with your Bible to actually look at you. Second Chronicle, or First Chronicles 16, 9 says that his eyes go to and fro throughout the world looking for whose heart is loyal to him. And I'm saying to you right now, you do not want to experience the Ichabod moment. Nothing scares me more when the glory leaves it scared Moses so much that he veiled his face. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to ever get to a stage where I think it's about me. I don't want to ever get to a stage where, you know, somebody says, good sermon, and I go, oh, yeah, thanks, I worked really hard on it. Which is not true. The sermon comes from my overflow. It comes from my study. It comes from my time with God. And it always has to be. So people go, why don't you do like a series and all this here stuff? Because I can't stick to it. Because if God decides to take me in another direction, the series is ended. I tried that. The Jezebel and the Lila Spirit is going rife among the world. And I want to get to my, um, what did I get to? Paragraph. I want to get to my point. I want to get to what I'm trying to say. Because listen, there's a new narrative building. There's a narrative in which the church is being silent. There's a narrative in which Christianity is being criminalized. In certain Western countries, such as Canada, and we've, we've looked at that, it's being criminalized. And that's going to go across the board. We've heard people such as Joe Biden in America say that Christians, fundamentalist Christians, are a scourge on society. And he was rehearsing that. He was repeating that from guess who? The Pope, Pope Francis, who said the same thing called those who believe in the intrinsic word of God and do not update the word of God, do not twist the word of God to fit in with society, those people are scourge. I am telling you,
telling you right now, there's only one narrative. In Genesis 11, Nimrod tried to rewrite the story in the Maseroth and the stars so that it told a different story than the gospel story. Because up until that time, the gospel was not written down, the gospel was rehearsed, and it was told through the, the, the working out of the constellations. From the virgin birth to the return of the lion of Judah. And you could see that. And what you had through Nimrod is he tried to, to twist this. And you're seeing it today. People like Klaus Schwab trying to twist it. Can I say the enemy is trying to twist this in your own mind? Where you go, the Bible says that in Psalm 103, verse 3, that he heals all of my infirmities. But, you know what? I don't believe it because I'm not feeling the, 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 the outworking of healing right now. Why do Christians always go on feeling? Seriously, do you not realize that's a manipulative tool of the enemy? When you work on your feelings and your feelings only, that can be manipulated. Whenever you're prayed for it and you receive healing, it is up to you to receive it even before you feel it. And every time a pain or something comes against you, then your job is to resist that. Because that's the devil trying to sow that whisper. That's the Jezebel spur. Because the devil is not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. He is using the demonic structure of, of his horde of the third of the heavenly host to come against each and every one of you and to sow a different narrative about your life. God has called you. Do you realize God has called you? You're not called to be a pew sitter. You're called to be a soul winner. You're called to be a fisher of men. You're called to go out and change the atmosphere for Jesus. You're not called to, to let the circumstances and the stress and the, 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 the effects of life hold you down. You're called to get up, to go out, and regardless of what you feel, because you're not moved by your feelings, you go out and you're on fire and you change the atmosphere for Jesus. Come on. This is what you're called to do. And if you get it through your head, people, honestly, you, you stop worrying. I said this, Kelly and I were talking, um, we were talking to people on Wednesday, and she was sharing, and she was, she was praying with them. And one of the things that she said, and I, because I, I'm me, I corrected, which uh, Kelly isn't here today, she's not very well, but... Um, <laughs> And I get what she was saying, because the, the, the person she's talking to says, I have doubts. And she says, everybody has doubts. We shouldn't. Seriously, we shouldn't. When we doubt, we're letting a new narrative build. I love what Reinhard Bonnke said. He was questioned once. He said, do you ever doubt what you believe? Do you ever have doubts? And he says, I have doubts. He says, what do you doubt? He says, I doubt my doubts. <laughs> Anytime the, the enemy tries to sow, you know what? That person will not be healed. No, I'm going to silence that. I doubt that voice because that voice is from the pit of hell. I am just going to hold fast to the voice of God. You can't create an ideology or a theology based on your circumstance. You can only take it from the word of God. And you can only hold on to it from the word of God. And I said, the problem with, this is what I believe personally, I'll tell you. The problem with Christianity is that we propagate our needs as our God. When I, we do, we put our needs ahead of God and say, God, do you know what? I will come to you. And has anybody ever done this? Oh, God, I will serve you if this prayer is just answered. I God, God if, I, if you do this for me, I promise you I will do that. And you're putting your, your need ahead of God. But see, this is the thing. And it's a, that's a narrative uh, uh, propagation to trying to sow into your ears, trying to give you a different way of thinking. This is what it should be. Spend time face to face. Panem el Bahem. Whenever you go and you just say, I'm shutting off the world. Mobile phone, dead. Computer, off. Bible, open. God, it's you and me. God, if you keep me in here for 10 minutes, I'll praise your name. If you keep me in here for 10 days, I will praise your name. Because it's me and you. I don't want to come out the same way I went in. Imagine if a church came to church thinking the exact same thing. And God, I don't even know if that guy up the front was speaking the truth. So I'm just going to wait and hear from you. I'm going to, oh God, I listen, I used to do this all the time. I used to read my Bible in the midst of a service. I don't care if you do that. I'm not really concerned if you're listening to me. I am concerned if you're listening to him. 
Because he is the one that you need to talk to. He is the one that you need to commune with. And when you come out of the presence of God, when Moses came down the mountain, listen, he wasn't ever sick. He wasn't struggling. He got, he, listen, he didn't even start his ministry until he was 80 years old. But most of us are saying, oh, 80 years old, oh, I'll be retired, I'll be sitting at home. I'm telling you, when you spend time and you're a present seeker, you do not then need to pray and worry about healing, provision. We pray and we talk to him, make your petitions known. But when you start to pray with an attitude of spending time with him, it changes everything. You realize that you start to reflect him. Do you know wherever Jesus went, healing happened? Do you know that no one ever died in the presence of Jesus? He had to wait four days to make sure Lazarus wasn't just dead, but was decaying and was stinking and no one would go near his tomb. Because he knew that if he was in the presence of Lazarus, Lazarus couldn't have dropped dead. Why? Because the presence of God is what it's all about. The more time you spend in his presence, then you don't need... Whenever you're a presence seeker, it's not seeking the petition. The petition is not God. God is God. I want to give you this, and I, I'm, I'm more of a time now. <laughs> the answer. The answer to defeating a new narrative rising in your ear about you and towards you and to destroy and destruct and deceive you. The new narrative that tries to sweep across this world that says, live in your sin, sin's okay. The new narrative that is trying to silence the word of God and silence the voice of God corporately and in your life. I'll give you the answer. First of all, realize that you are not a light projector, but a light reflector. Spend time with him. Be someone who spends so much time in the secret room that when you come out, there's something different about you. Don't let Jezebel deceive you to stand anywhere else but in the presence of God. Honestly, get home today. Just even if you switch off the TV, if the kids are doing your head and listen, you know, Tie them up. No, don't do that, actually. Um, but <laughs> spend time with him just in his presence. Don't tolerate, number two, don't tolerate or appease the voice that comes to distract and deceive. That's what Eve done. She tolerated the voice of the serpent. She appeased the voice of the serpent. And she believed the voice of the serpent. Do not do that. And here's the one I want to get to. Fire back with the real narrative. Let me tell you a story quickly. In 1565, there was the storming of Malta. So there, at this point, Islam um, ran the biggest slave trade the world has ever seen. Modern slave trade did not come close to it. They reckoned that at any given time there were 80 million slaves. And it was propagated under, at this point under Suleiman the Magnificent. And they would go about, there's actually, a, there was an Irish village where they went down and, and uh, the Muslim army or the Islamic army stopped and they took the whole of the Irish village off them. I don't know if they ever get them back because we can talk. Make a little bit sense. But this slave trade went throughout the world. And in uh, 1522, there was a young guy who was, on the sl who was a slave. His name was De La, Vette, De, De La Vallette, right? I'm sorry, Louis, I can't speak French, right? So it's, I'm butchering it, but just take it. And Vallette was a slave for a year. Young boy, 20, 20 hours a day, rowing on this boat. Eventually, he got free from his slavery. And he became part of the Crusades. He became part of the Order of St. John. And... Part of this, he grew in, in his entrenched belief in Christ. Fast forward to 1565. The Muslim army are coming because they are wanting to bring their slave trade and really conquer most of Europe. This is the first attempt to conquer, well, they tried it in 1522, but this is the major attempt to conquer Europe. And so they came in and they realized Malta was the linchpin. If they got Malta, they could then go out from there and they could, they could control and enslave so many, so many people in Europe. And so, Vallette, who's by this age 71 years old and is the master of the order, he has 700 knights, decides to hold St. Elmo's Fort in Malta. 
Because he knows that if he holds this, he can tie up the Muslim army that have been in force for so long that reinforcements will come and, let, and their, their idea of slavery and, and slavery across the Europe will be quashed. So what happens? You get Suleiman the, uh, the, the Magnificent sends his generals and his army and he has a guy, Mustafa, and Mustafa comes in and they come in with 193 ships over 48,000 army, over 6,000 of the Janissaries, who are the, the invincible ones of the army. He comes in with the, the Larissaries, who are the, they're, they're a, a, a fighting force that are propped up on hallucinogenic drugs, so when they fight, they just, ah, right? 48,000 against 700. Now I love this, the war goes on. They go, so, uh, Maleficent, or Suleiman the, the Magnificent has said that it will take three days to conquer Malta. Three days. And they have to get through Sudan's fort. So what happens is Philip says, right guys, we're going to stand and if we die here, we die for Christ. We're going to stand and we're going to be the last line of defense for this part of the world. We're going to make sure they can't invade. We're going to stand here. And what happens is three days comes and goes. And every time, like 2,000 of the invincible ones come up the hill to try and attack the fort, 2,000 die in comparison to 10 nights. Right? So there's a real differentiation between what you're seeing happen on one side, the attack of the enemy, and what you're seeing happen on those who are standing for God at this time. And remember, the Bible says, you will, one will chase 1,000, and two will chase 10,000. There's greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. When you trust in God and rely on God, it doesn't matter what comes against you. It doesn't matter what battle you're in. You know that my God is bigger than any problem, any attack that I go through. I love this. I got told, by the way, by both my wife and my daughter not to tell this story. <laughs> because I find it kind of funny and it's probably a wee bit gross. So it goes on. This war happens and it, it goes on. And it's going on and on and on. Three days pass, a week pass, two weeks pass. It goes up to 35 days. And what's happening is the invading army is just dying and dying and dying and falling by the droves. Now there's no, there's no uh, reinforcements. So what they realized, the Islamic army realized that St. Elmo was getting reinforcements and resupplies. So they were getting all these, the ammunition, they were getting the food and all that, resupplied from a neighboring village. So they cut off the supplies and St. Elmo's now alone. The, the fort is now alone. And what I love is Mustafa says, right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna strike fear into their heart and we're gonna encourage our soldiers so for every Christian knight who died, they chopped off their head and they crucified them and put them on display for everybody to look upon that and go, look at what we're doing. Look at this. We've chopped off their head and we've crucified them. It was to instill fear in the heart of the Christian and it was to instill a, a drive and a new narrative in the attacking force. Belet, the 71-year-old, who probably in modern days would be retired, master of the order says what we're going to do for every attacking soldier who's attacked us I want you to chop up their body and put them in the cannon this is why I was told not to tell this because I, I find this funny only find it funny not from what actually happened but spiritually thinking because I can see God in this right in the sense that what happens is they're, they're chopping up they're trying to give you a new narrative look at this Look at this. Look, strike fear into their heart. And what happens is Philet just pew, 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 pew. all the cannons start firing the dead bodies back. Because what is meant for your evil, God turns around for good. What is meant to harm you, you will fire back at the devil. And any time sickness comes near your door, you fire back at the devil and say, look at how God healed me. Whenever lack comes against your door, you know God is my provider. He provides all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I don't care what you're firing at me, devil. I'm going to fire back the testimony of what I'm going through where I see God's glory manifest. Sorry, I have a twisted sense of humor, by the way, so don't take me wrong in this. I'm not saying what happened was right or anything like that. I just like the mindset of Philip. He wouldn't let the new nar narrative of seeing their Christian brothers in arms crucified and beheaded strike fear into their heart. Instead, he says, no, 
we're going to fire back the true narrative that for every 10 they kill of us, we're killing thousands. And boom, boom, boom. And it literally was rain and men. <laughs> Sorry, it's my sense of humor. I can't help it. But can I just point out, this is what we need to do. The devil comes against you. He comes against you today, tomorrow, the next day. And he tries to attack you through the spirit of Jezebel to try and get and silence the voice of God in your life. Through the, the spirit of Delilah that tries to whisper a new narrative, tries to bind your power and walking in that power. I say, we fire back. We are overcomers according to scripture, Revelation 12, 11, by the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. So when I get an ache, a pain, or a hurt myself, I start to go, God, why would I worry about that? You've healed me in the past. I'm a moron, and I broke my back twice. And you healed it twice. Lord, I saw my son's face burnt off before me. Told that he would be scarred for the rest of his life. Told that he needed plastic surgery, reconstructive surgery, more than one, continuous surgeries. And yet you healed him that he is... Are any of my other kids in here? I was going to say, all right, Brown's in the back. Can't say he is one of the best looking kids I've got. <laughs> I've seen God manifest in the healing terms, so I'm not going to ever doubt him in that. So whenever sickness comes near your door, like Kelly today, and we're going to pray for her as well, she's got a, a kidney infection. In fact, there's quite a lot of people that are suffering the same thing at the minute, and we're going to pray for them. But I personally believe that it's not even putting the, the petition as major point in your prayer. It's about being in his presence. When you realize you walk with the I am, oh, you should have a gangster swagger. Seriously, you should not fear what the devil throws against you. You should have the, you know, the, the, the East Belfast one. You should have that because you know that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You serve the I am. Whenever you start to look at your finances and you go, oh my goodness, I don't know how we're going to pay the mortgage. Trust God. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. We went through a period where we were going bankrupt, we had no money, and God said to us, whatever comes into your door, whatever comes into your business, give away. All right, but we can't feed ourselves. Kelly and I had started, stopped eating. We're only feeding the kids at this stage. And when we done this, we started posting money through people's doors. What, what amazed us, those people then went, what? Is this what God really, and they got saved. And in the process, we'd start, we'd be fast and worrying, fast and stressed, and, and God provided us for us in bigger and better ways than we could have imagined. When you trust God in every area, it doesn't matter what the devil throws, you stand there with your baseball bat ready to hit it right back at him. Go, whatever he fires against you, you fire back the testimony. Everybody's got a testimony, I'm telling you. Every one of you has a testimony that, that like I let Broderick, I sat we, the other day, you told me yours. I was like, oh, wow, that was awesome. Look at how the devil took a beating in that. That's what it's about. These testimonies need to be rehearsed. You're more than an overcomer. You're a king, queen, and high, high priest in Jesus' name. You're more than a conqueror. But you've got to take the mindset like the left had. That look, it doesn't matter what comes against my flesh. I'm not going to worry or stress or fear or what comes against me. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Instead, I'm going to fight this spiritual fight. I'm going to get up every morning. I'm going to speak out in truth. I'm going to speak the true narrative against the new narrative. When the world says you must comply and be complacent, when the world says that sin should be tolerated, when the world says that it doesn't matter what you believe, there are many roads to heaven, I'm going to turn around and say no. No more. Amen. No more in Jesus' name. We're going to speak truth. There's one way to heaven. And I don't care if you came in here with a new age attitude that you get to heaven through all these different doors. Listen, the Bible is extremely clear. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one, no one comes to the Father but by him. Pope Francis was asked recently in an interview, would your God forgive and have grace upon those who don't believe in him? And he said, well, Christians enter into heaven through believing in Jesus. But others, 
if they just obey their conscience, then that'll be sufficient. Do you understand the days that we live in? This warfare is everywhere. This warfare is increasing, and it's going to increase in your personal life because the devil wants you off track. I say, get your baseball bat out. I know in, in Belfast that means something different, but I mean to actually hit back the weapon that he forms against you. Seriously. How cool is it whenever an attack comes against you and you just go, I'm going to hit, this is going to be one over the fences. Amen? Amen. Guys, stand for me. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. I'm going to say right now, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus, name above all names, King of Kings, you do not need to worry. You do not need to fear. And you need to silence the voice of the enemy. Some of you, listen, the enemy is a deceiver, he's a deceptor. He, what, the way he comes in is subtle. Delilah was subtle. He comes in to attack you subtle and you think, oh, you know, I feel bad or whatever. And then you let that feeling become more than just an experience and you let it become depression. Don't. Learn to silence his voice. How dare he talk to the righteous of God? How dare he think he can speak in your ear? You're a child of God. And you cannot do all things. Amen? Amen. Guys, let's worship. And... Again, we're going to take up a wee offering. If you came prepared to give, please do so. We will also, like this offering is all towards trying to get the new church sanctuary ready. So hopefully I'll be ready in a few weeks.
or plan them for the first of March or first week of March to be in the new sanctuary. And um, praise God, it will fit more of you. So, which is needed right now. So that's that's a good thing. Um, and we've got. Listen, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for those who are missing today, those who are sick. So, if you just bow your heads and close your eyes, Father God, I just thank you, Lord, that healing is found in your presence. That nor we're not coming seeking healing devoid of you. We're seeking healing in your midst. Lord, that whenever your dew settles upon Mount Hermon, we know that we are unified in the thought process that you heal all. That you cover all our sins and heal all our infirmities. So right now, I speak against kidney infections. I bind them and I curse them out in the name of Jesus. I curse the spirit of infirmity in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. The spirit of cancer, we curse you in the name of Jesus. You have no room here and no room to move in Jesus' mighty name. We, we speak to those who are suffering ailments and suffering pains in the back and the neck and we curse it in the name of Jesus, Lord. We will give no room for that narrative. Instead, it is just your way and your word and there was no one who came to you who was devoid of that healing process Lord, I just thank you for your presence and your process of healing. Lord, I thank you that people are being set free right now. We speak against demonic uh, infestation or affliction or, or, or we speak against oppression by the demons right now and we say that mindset free, depression go in Jesus' name. Those who are stuck in a cycle of fear, we set you free by the name that sets all free, by the King of kings, by the Lord of lords, by Jesus Christ. And we say right now in Jesus' name, let the Spirit of God rise up in your people so that so much that every ailment, every depression that thought, every every thought that does not line up with your word is now brought subject and brought under the authority of your word. We take all thoughts captive to try and exalt themselves against the knowledge of you, Lord, and say it is all about you. It is all about you. And in your presence, we experience all things that we need. Lord, let us be like Mary, not like the Martha. Let, let us be like Mary who sit at your feet and do the needful thing. So when we are experiencing the attacks of the enemy, we do not give uh, room to that experience, nor do we give weight to it. We just spend time at your feet, Lord. And Lord, I am thankful that you have given this church a heart for your presence. I thank you that this is a presence seeking people. And Lord, I thank you that you're in their midst wherever they walk. It doesn't matter what comes against them or the shadow of death. You are in their midst. And Father, I just thank you that you're above and not beneath. And you make us to be your children. And bless us in the process, Lord. I just thank you for healing. I just thank you for breakthrough. And I thank you for your presence more than anything else. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.